Hi everyone, welcome to another episode here at You Can Rest Here. I'm really excited, as always, and I'm hoping that you are too. You know one thing I'm just getting used to with now recording both visual and audio is that now I have to dress up. So prior to recording just audio, I could literally get out of bed, sit on my desk and begin to record. But now I have to wear baths. So how are we feeling about the outfit so far? Are you enjoying my look? Today I'm wearing green trousers and a white shirt that I stole from my friend. (laughs) So I'm sorry, but um, yeah, rate the looks. You know, let us know what kind of looks you'd like to see and I will probably ignore what you say <laughs> and wear whatever I want. But I'm, I am I like doing this. I think I'm getting more used to video. Um, today we're going to talk about waiting. But before we get to that, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who has listened to the last two episodes. If you haven't, please go back um, to the last two I think that parts of it might change your life and just really listen to what I genuinely believe the Lord is saying and how he's trying to disciple us in this season of our lives. And he thank you to everyone for the love and for the listens and just for the encouragement from episode one to episode two. So we're talking about waiting today and I think reading the title, anybody who is here, you probably clicked on it out of desperation, right? God, I'm tired of waiting. And what I'm trying to do is to offer you a different outlook on waiting that maybe you haven't ever seen before and hopefully will change and transform your mind. So I remember a Recently, I think this was in 2020. Um, 2020, of course, was an absolute storm for so many of us, but particularly me, right? Um, I had just started a job in 2019, and by 2020, the job came to a halt because of the coronavirus. And when this happened, I think already I was in a crisis of just like trying to figure out who am I what was I created to do and finally I had hold of a title that I could say hi I'm Maz and I do this and it was ripped underneath me I would just look in the mirror all the time and just think like, what am I on this earth for? What am I doing? Even the things that I feel like I'm supposed to be doing, how well am I even doing it? Because it's one thing to lose a job when you're like 50 or you're 40 and you've already established your career, right? But like being in your 20s and figuring life out and then having a job loss so early, it really shakes you in a way that I I don't think I've even fully come to terms with. So yeah, I was out of work, didn't have much to do. I'd wake up every day and just wonder, God, like, is it that you have no plans for my life? Or what exactly do you want from me? And I think a lot of what I was feeling was also the shame of having to tell people that I don't know what God is doing in my life. The shame of having to be like, oh, I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting for God to provide me a solution. Because no matter how much people love you, they want to see you succeed, right? And sometimes when you want people to succeed, you want to pull them out of where God has them to another place because it will benefit you just knowing that they're okay to your standards. I kicked a fuss, I, I, I threw tantrums at the Lord and one day in the shower, I, I, I said to God, why does it feel like I'm putting so much effort into figuring life out and it's not happening? And the Lord said to me, my love, your time has not yet come. You have to wait. And 
some people would be offended by a statement like that and it's like god i'm tired of waiting but i was like oh my gosh so all this trying to force things to happen all the exhaustion all the striving maybe it just wasn't time what i hope you understand from this episode is that Waiting is in a season. I don't want to talk about waiting seasons. You know, as Christians, we like to call everything a season. I'm in my season of this. I'm in my season of that. Waiting is not a season. There is no waiting season. Waiting is not seasonal. It is something we are constantly going to be a part of in life. It is actually a lifestyle. So all of us are on a journey of waiting and expectation constantly we will always be waiting for something when the sun is up you're waiting for for the sun to go down so it's nighttime when it's summer you wait for autumn when it's winter you wait for spring everybody will constantly be waiting and just so you even understand the magnitude of our waiting listen to this you can close your eyes and just listen to this tale as a young child you wait to become a teenager as a teenager, you wait to become an adult. When you do become an adult, the independence of being an adult becomes overwhelming. So the one time you were looking for, for independence and freedom, now you have it. Now your independence requires you to have money to support that independence. No longer will your parents be cooking meals for you. You now have to fend for yourself. From that point, you're now living alone. Living alone now feels a bit lonely. You feel, you feel like you're, you need companionship. And then now you're waiting for the person that you might fall in love with. And then no longer will you be alone. Two will become one. But before that two becomes one, you wait for marriage. When marriage comes, a lot of people will wait for a child. You have that child and maybe you want more children, then you wait for the more. When you have those three children and there are five of you in that family, you wait to get a car that's big enough to accommodate everybody. When you get the car that's big enough to accommodate everybody and that car that's big enough breaks down, you wait to buy another one. And the cycle continues. Waiting never ends. Waiting is our life. And I'm sorry to anyone who has ever been sold a Christianity that is around instant gratification. Even our Lord and Savior had to wait for 30 years before he embarked on his ministerial position. How much more so we? And if you look at the power of Jesus' waiting, his waiting now ended up being a journey that would lead him to reconciling all of humanity to the Father. Sometimes people make you think that there is a spirit of delay on your life and you have to cast and bind that spirit of delay away. But this very thing that God has designed, which is the waiting, has been designed to make you more like him. So every time you cheat yourself out of waiting, you are losing an opportunity to become more like Christ. What is the purpose of waiting? Some people get to waiting and it's just like, let's just get it over and done with. If you get into, into a, a, a period of your life where God is intentionally asking you to wait, there is a purpose behind it. And the worst thing the enemy can ever make you think is that God is wasting his time by asking you to wait. The purpose of our waiting is to become more like Christ. Um, oftentimes we pray away the very things that God has designed to better us and to sanctify us. Waiting therefore becomes integral to our becoming. Um, I think waiting is also important because waiting is an honor of the rhythms of life and it's an honor of the times and the seasons of our life. 
I don't know, I don't know about you, but there are certain fruits and vegetables that I want to be available to me 24 seven. Like, but as a holistic nutritionist, right? I always tell my clients, make sure you eat seasonally. We have sometimes forgotten the importance of seasonal eating and we now want everything on demand. In Nigeria, we have something that a lot of people call the African cherry. Um, people in the South call it udara. Um, people in the East call it wanu. And then people in the West call it agbalumo. Agbalumo is my favorite African fruit. Like all time, it is unbeatable. When it's sour, I love it. When it's sweet, I love it. However it comes, I love it. Many of us want to eat agbalumo in every season, but nature has to wait till it can produce this fruit. What has happened is that scientists and greedy farmers have found a way to genetically modify fruits to ensure that you can have it 24 seven. So now people can get avocados 24 seven. Now people can get watermen, watermelon, 24 7 as well we now refuse to eat seasonally because of the access that we have to everything what we don't realize is that not only do gmo fruits and vegetables remove the seasonalities when you have these fruits outside of the season they're supposed to be in what typically happens is that the nutrient density also reduces and the potency of the vitamins and the minerals in these fruits are also reduced so ultimately the price of not waiting is that your body is polluted Waiting makes you, in this sense, a happier and a healthier human being. Number three, waiting strengthens you for the journey that lies ahead. In Isaiah 40, 31, it says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And there are certain times that, I don't know about you, I've hit a point where I feel so weak and exhausted. Like Elijah, I, I, I've, I've, I feel like I've exhausted myself to the point that I no longer want to live. And then God is like, Elijah, wait. Let me give you bread. Wait, relax. You don't have to prove anything to me because oftentimes our inability to wait is because we have something to prove. But waiting strengthens you for the journey ahead. Without waiting, there is a great danger and a susceptibility to find God somewhere else or to even make yourself your own God. God is a God of process and everybody in scripture had to honor the fact that he is process led. God isn't concerned about time per se. Jesus could have started preaching at the age of 10 when he was found in the temple, but he had to wait. Maturity is one of the greatest examples of process, which is why God constantly calls us to greater realms of maturity. I've said all of this about waiting, about how waiting is important and, and you know, waiting makes you healthy and it makes you happier and it makes you more like God. But waiting is also hard. And I don't want to be one of those people who, just because I know something, head knowledge, I ignore the fact that the journey from the head to the heart is difficult. Waiting is uncomfortable. Um, I don't think there's ever been a, a waiting that I've enjoyed. <laughs> you know, if I'm honest, Waiting is unbearable. Waiting has the ability to either make you better or make you bitter. And I have to admit that many times I've had to wait on the Lord for something he himself has promised 
sometimes I've become bitter in the process, but the mercy of God has allowed me to become better. There's a beauty whilst we're waiting, and I think some of us have 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 lost that opportunity or have have allowed life to steal that opportunity whilst we're waiting to say, God, I don't like being here. I'm sick and tired of having to wait. I want to get to the other side. If you're not honest with God in that way, you will never be able to enjoy the fullness of intimacy with him. So yes, a lot of the time I don't enjoy waiting, but oftentimes I see that there is a price to the compromise that's on the other side of me rushing ahead of God. I think what has been most difficult for me feeling is feeling like I'm ready for something and God asking me to wait. You know, um, it's like feeling like you're anointed, but God is saying, okay, forget this, you're anointing, or you still have to wait. What we don't realize about this mighty King David that we love is that David was anointed at the age of 15. Samuel went to anoint David when he was 15 years old. But David didn't become king until he was 30. And you can see this in 2 Samuel um, 5 to 4. But we see the fruit of waiting in David's life. All the time that it might have seemed like nothing was happening when Saul was chasing David and when so many awful things were happening to him and he was facing betrayal from the people that he loved so much. I believe that if David didn't wait to become king, he would have never become king. I believe that David learned obedience by the things he suffered through the waiting. Each of us will experience these dark seasons where we feel hidden, where we feel like we're able to do something, but God is telling us not to. And oftentimes I'm consoled by the fact that for 30 years, Jesus could have been doing what he was called to do, which was to preach and to reconcile people back to the father, but he had to wait. That's why in Hebrews four, it says, for we do not have a high priest who is not acquainted with our suffering. Jesus is so acquainted with the fact that waiting is not easy. So every time that you catch yourself in the pit, and you feel like, oh my God, waiting is difficult. I pray that you you know that you have a God in heaven who's like my, my daughter, my son. I know how you feel. No matter how hard it is to wait, I want to tell you that it is worse to not wait. I'm going to say that again. No matter how hard it is to wait, I want you to know that it is worse to go when God has not sent you. You look at the tale of Abraham and Sarah. So at this point, the Lord has already said to Abraham and Sarah, you know, Abraham, you're going to be a father of many nations. But Abraham is at this point is about 70 years old. And still this father of many nations has no child. So Sarah takes it into her own hands and she says, God, I'm not going to wait on you anymore. Mm -mm. I am going to make sure that Abraham becomes the father of many nations that you said he should become, but you have not done anything about it, so I will. So Sarah brings Hagar, the servant in the house, and says, Hagar, you're going to sleep with my husband, and my husband is going to, you know, become this father of many nations that God God has said he's, he's supposed to be, because I am unable to bear a child. Remember, she said this to herself. God never said to Sarah that she wouldn't be able to bear a child. Now, what happens is that Hagar becomes pregnant, woohoo, but then Sarah is offended because Hagar starts being rude to Sarah, starts treating her with contempt, and now there's jealousy and strife in that house. 
one person's inability to wait now created this catastrophe in a marriage that was or that was okay sometimes we talk about this in terms of ishmael and what has has come out of the lineage of ishmael but i want us to think about it in a very simplistic way there was a breakdown in the marriage between abraham and sarah the moment sarah and abraham failed to wait on god to bring forth his promise and what we learn from this is that you can't bamboozle god to honor your impatience yes a child was born but this was still outside of god's will because god needed them to wait Sarah's actions to help God out and not wait on a promise that was bound to happen. Saul also shows us the price of not waiting. And I think this Saul story is 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 one that I guess maybe hits a bit closer to home because some of you are listening to this like I would never give a concubine to my husband. So I don't need to worry about that. But what happens with Saul in 1 Samuel 13? Saul is told by Samuel that he should wait for 7 days before he offers a sacrifice unto the Lord. Samuel says, "I know you can offer the sacrifice now, but wait until I arrive." So Saul waited for Samuel for 7 days. So it's not that Saul didn't wait, he waited for 7 days. But now his obedience was not complete. The amount of time that had been told by Samuel that he should wait had now passed. So maybe it was like God, maybe God was saying to to Saul wait for 7 days and maybe 5 hours or maybe 10 hours. But once it got to that 7 days mark, Saul is like Omo, oh, I'm tired do. I can't do this anymore. I can't wait any longer. And he was on the verge of the fulfillment of the promise that was on the other side of waiting but what does Saul do he offers the sacrifice without Samuel being there when Samuel comes Samuel's like so what have you done and i think that's what god says to so many of us is that what have you done why couldn't you just wait and do you know what Saul says Saul says i was too afraid i feared that my army would be limited and i feared that i would be left all alone so he decided to take matters into his own hands and then samuel says to saul this is a foolish thing that you have done and the bible tells us that the favor of the lord because of saul's inability to wait upon the lord now left him and so many of us have lost so much not because of any devil not because of any opposition but because of our failure to wait every time you move out of fear that god won't show up you lose something you make yourself god and then you make yourself accountable to yourself and what that means is that you are demonstrating to god that actually i don't trust you enough Another key thing about this Saul and Samuel um interaction is that Saul was fine waiting until the threat of men leaving him came until the fear of man entered into the picture so the moment that Saul feared that he would be he would be all alone and people wouldn't be there to cheer him on and support him he stopped waiting this also goes to show that if it's not time for you to go and you go out of the fear of man you alone will be left with the mess god didn't blame all these people for leaving saul or for threatening to leave him it was only saul that lost favor with god so don't let anyone force you out of the wait when i when i i was waiting for a y- almost a year for a new job or even for a revelation of what i was supposed to do i can't tell you the amount of people good well meaning people that were like mas like you need to do something you need to do this you need to do that but if i moved out out of the will of god 
I would have been the one picking up the pieces of the mess of the, uh, that I would have made out of my life. Everybody else would have gone to do whatever they needed to. I would have been the one who had to now live with the mess of my disobedience. And of course we have the mercy of God, right? But sometimes if, if, if there doesn't have, a, have to be a mess, right? Maybe just obey what God is saying, which might be to wait. And I say the stories of all these people still acknowledging that I have so much sympathy for Abraham, for Sarah, and for Saul. Because I have been there many times. Most recently, when it comes to romantic relationships and having to wait well on God's promise in that regard, right? I remember last year, the Lord said to me that you're going to meet your person. You're going to meet the person that I want you to do life with forever. And it gets to about July. We're now like midway through the year. And I'm like, okay, God, what is going on? I haven't seen anybody. Um, but at this point, a lot of people have started like popping up. You know, these like, hey, big head messages you get here and there, people you haven't spoken to in years, or you're like going out and typically people will leave you alone. But now it's like you're the center of attention. And of course, December is getting closer. And I'm aware that God has said this year will be the year. So I start entertaining all sorts of individuals get to know them, wasting my time, wasting their time actually mostly because maybe a conversation and I already know this isn't going anywhere, but I'm like, okay, God, you haven't shown me the real thing. So maybe I should waste a bit of time. Maybe I shouldn't wait because my waiting clearly isn't producing anything. So maybe I should help you, God. So I'll go on some dates to help you, God. I'll, you know, get to know people to help you. And by August, I remember I just sitting with the Lord and, and just feeling like my vision was getting blurrier and blurrier. And God just said to me, I never asked you to do any of the things you're doing. I never asked you to go to talk to this person. I never asked you to go on this date. All I asked you to do was to wait because the promise is going to fulfill itself, but you just have to wait. So I repented before the Lord. I, I repented for not trusting him enough and now taking matters into my own hands, right? And God in his mercy taught me how to wait again. And in waiting, he opened my eyes. So the point in time that I met my person, right? I knew this was it. I knew that there wasn't any counterfeit. Nobody could tell me twice. Like I knew it, like I know my name, but if I kept entertaining and failing to wait, God knows who I would be with right now. God knows if I would even be doing this podcast because maybe that person would have pushed me so far out of alignment with the purposes and the plans that God has for me. Whereas this person is pushing me towards what God is asking me to do. Just maybe you never know the price and the consequence of your inability to wait. This is why it's so important that whilst you're waiting, you're not just waiting and twiddling your thumbs and sleeping, you're praying. Because there will be many counterfeits of the real thing. I can't tell you the amount of guys that I met last year, all counterfeits. They, some of them had the appearance of the real thing, right? Like maybe there were certain traits that the Lord would tell me that, oh, my daughter, your husband is going to be like this, or he's going to have this temperament. And some of them would have maybe like seven out of 10. So just counterfeits. And if you are not discerning, you will fall for a false illusion of what God has promised for you. It's all fake. It's all smoke and mirrors. It might look like the real thing, but I promise you, because you haven't waited, it definitely is not the real thing. What waking does is that waking increases your discernment. It makes you sharp spiritually, and it also helps you to walk in truth and clarity 
and it stops things from being mere coincidences to being fate. There are people that I know, there are people you know, you might even be one of these people who fail to wait and you have entered into relationships and even marriages with people you had no business being with. It is painful to have a life where constantly you have to wonder if only, what if I just waited on the Lord? There are a lot of people who in desperation of feeling like you will be in financial lack, you took on jobs that you had no business being in, jobs that were not furthering the purpose of God in your life, were not furthering the kingdom of God in any way. But instead, God was in the waiting, trying to talk to you about a business that was not going to just transform your life, but transform a generation but you failed to wait. And now you're sat behind a desk, maybe listening to this very podcast, and that is a price of your disobedience. There are also other people that you know you should have waited for a better job, a job that you would have leapt out of bed in the morning so excited to go to that job. But instead now, you're at a place where You hate it, you hate the work culture, you hate the hustle and the bustle, but God had a place that wouldn't have stolen the peace and the rest of your soul. If only, if only, if only. How do we wait well? What does waiting well look like? Um, There are a couple of things that I know for me have made waiting easier and we see a lot of these things in scripture number one god and the presence of god it is impossible to wait on god without god if you are waiting on god without god you are just waiting and there is no strength because what it says in isaiah is that those who wait on the lord if you are just waiting on netflix if you are just waiting on your bed If you are just waiting and complaining, you are not really waiting. So God makes waiting easier. The presence of God and just the ability to be vulnerable in the presence of God makes waiting so much easier. And it makes it bearable. Secondly, holding on to hope and the promises that God has for you. God is a God of hope, right? And he never brings you into waiting hopeless. So holding on to hope, and again, hope is spiritual, right? Hope sustains you whilst you're waiting because hope is a promise that you might be here today, but you're going to get to the other side. Hope is also a promise that you may not be there yet, but you have moved. You're making gradual steps towards what God has promised you is on the other side of your obedience to wait. Another thing that has been so encouraging for me, and also you look at Elizabeth, how she encouraged Mary, is people. The encouragement that God can send from others. Look at today alone, right? I'm sat here recording, but a few moments ago, you wouldn't know this. I had broke down in tears because so many things were just not going right with this very video that you're watching. And I started panicking. And it was the encouragement of the people in this room, my team, my partner, that has helped me to keep going. It's the encouragement of somebody who loves you, who will say, Maz, you cannot quit on yourself. You cannot quit on what God has for you. There are so many times, my sister, I'll tell Orezi, I'm done, I'm tired. And Orezi will be like, what will happen to everybody else? 
If you're tired, what will happen to an entire generation of people who are on the other side of your obedience? So encouragement makes waiting easier. Another thing is purity of heart, right? Staying away from comparison and, and you know, the lies that the enemy might feed you by telling you, look at where everybody else is and look at your own life. It really helps to not compare yourself and that all comes to a pure heart. So if you find yourself waiting on God for anything, waiting on God for a child, waiting on God for a relationship, waiting on God for a job, waiting on God to even know why you exist on this earth, right? Just continually ask the Holy Spirit to purify your heart. In Psalm 24, it says that who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. So you want to ascend. You want to go from one level in life to another, one level of glory to another. You must have a pure heart because blessed are those who are pure in heart. Many of us will find ourselves dealing with jealousy and comparison whilst we're waiting. Crying out daily for a pure heart is what will save you. Because waiting has this painful ability to expose what is really in your heart and what you really believe about yourself and what you also really believe about others. Another thing that has encouraged people in the Bible and will encourage you is dreams and visions. I pray that you will experience an increase of dreams and visions. There's a type of way that God can speak to you in dreams and in visions that even whilst you're waiting, you are sustained with strength because you know what you've seen and no current circumstance can take that dream away from you. And finally, the fear of the Lord, you know, I fear God and I really respect him. There's a song that we always sing at church. It's Ero Loro Bami. That song says that I fear God and I really respect him. And I fear God and I really respect him enough not to move outside of his pace. The fear of the Lord is really the beginning of wisdom. I want us to know that waiting is not passive. Whilst you're waiting, God will still require you to move. Just not moving how you might expect you might be moving. Sometimes God asks people to wait and they do nothing at all. When God asked Joseph to wait, or instead, actually God didn't even ask Joseph to wait. When God forced Joseph to wait, God has given Joseph this lofty vision about how dream actually, you know, that's why he's Joseph the dreamer. He's given him this big dream about how he will rule the land and his family will bow to him. But now this dream is in question. Joseph is now in the pit. Joseph is now in prison. But Joseph kept serving God and moving to the pace of God and did whatever God needed him to do whilst he was still waiting on the promise. You wonder why would someone like Joseph, you're in a prison for goodness sake, like what, what else do you have to do? Like, if I was in prison and God was giving me assignments, would I do it? Like, God, you're forcing me to wait in this prison. I didn't do what they've, they've blamed me for doing, yet I'm still having to serve you, yes. Joseph had a compulsion to not just wait for freedom, but he had a compulsion to wait on the Lord. And whatever the Lord told Joseph to do, Joseph responded. That means in waiting, there is still movement. There are still things God will require from you whilst you wait. And then it is therefore for us 
to make the most of our waiting? Are you making the most out of your waiting? You're waiting on a child. Are you reading books about how to take care of that child? Are you understanding in scripture the purpose of a child? Maybe whilst you're waiting, you're supposed to do up the baby room in anticipation of the promise. Maybe you're supposed to buy clothes for this baby that you're waiting on. Have you been given a dream of twins? Maybe you're supposed to buy clothes for those twins in anticipation of their coming. What do you do whilst you're waiting? That's why hope is so integral because hope sustains faith and you need faith whilst you're waiting. Do not be stagnant whilst you're waiting. Obey every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, even when you're waiting. Imagine when Paul was locked up and in prison for things that really he, he didn't do, right? Imagine him deciding that whilst I'm in prison, I am not going to write. So many of us would be struggling right now because there are parts of scripture that Paul has written whilst he was waiting for freedom that are still encouraging us today. You're not supposed to do nothing when you're waiting on the Lord. The waiting is to produce fruit out of you and to make you more like him. So whenever you're waiting on God for something, think to yourself, what would Jesus do in this wait? And how can I wait on the Lord like Christ? There are important things I want us to note with waiting, right? Um, when you're waiting on God for something, ensure in the place of prayer, that what you're waiting for is the will of God for you. This might sound so silly to some people, but a lot of us are waiting for things that God never promised. For example, if you're waiting for a perfect life without struggle or pain, you're never gonna get that on this side of eternity. And on the flip side, if you're waiting to marry a man who is already married, Sounds ridiculous, right? But there are people who can take waiting on the Lord to gratify their fleshly and sinful desires, right? So you're waiting to be with somebody who is either married or in a committed relationship and you want God to honor that. God will never condone anything that is outside of his will or unbiblical. So make sure that what you're waiting for is in line with his will and with his word. Your waiting becomes a disciplinary exercise when you start waiting on what God never asked you to wait for. So if you wait, wait on what is true. You can't bamboozle God with your waiting. You will never be disappointed if what you're waiting for is God, right? What is the goal of waiting? The goal of waiting will always be God, right? Whatever God has desired also becomes a product, a byproduct of that waiting. The reward of waiting is Jesus. And if you get Jesus, you get everything you could ever desire in life. So your waiting is, is, is not just a spiritual exercise of becoming more like him. It's also a, a, a way to align you with his desire for your life, which means that in the waiting, what you want and what God wants finally merges. And finally, that thing you're waiting on is received. 
God is the God of all things. And if God is ever asking you to wait on a promise, trust that God is able to bring that promise to pass. But God always wants you to know that he is your reward. And the more you abide in him, the more you wait on him, the more you will receive the very things that your heart desire. You're not reaching the mountain and, oh, God is not just going to be like, oh, I just wanted you to ascend the mountain. When you arise, your loving father has something to offer you. But he first and foremost wants you to know that he is your greatest offering. It is foolish to make a small thing to God so big. It is foolish to be like, God, I'm, I'm going to wait on something instead of waiting on you. Because a byproduct again of you waiting on the Lord is that the Lord will give you that which he has promised. Another disclaimer is that it's important for so many of us to make peace with the fact that sometimes the reason why we haven't received what we're waiting on God for is because we're just not ready. We're just not ready to receive it. And if it comes at the point that we would like it to come in, it might destroy us. There's a pruning and a transformation that is required before the manifestation of that thing. You know, when Jesus told the disciples to wait and pray, I wonder sometimes if Peter waited and prayed, would he have denied Jesus? Maybe the strengthening and the pruning that he needed to stand on that day of testing was going to be found in the waiting. But then he refused to wait. Just maybe, I, I mean, you never know with these things, right? But sometimes we're just not prepared and waiting is what prepares us. You know, I've, I've found myself oftentimes trying to tell God that can you see how well I'm waiting? And then it becomes a performance. And I feel like God would be like, wow, my daughter, well done. How well you have waited. But you don't impress him by how well you wait. It is the state of your heart that moves him. So however the Lord is asking you to wait right now, make sure that your heart is in a posture of love, a posture of joy, and a posture of purity that will please the heart of the Father. I want to pray for you all. Not, I'm not praying for people in a season of waiting. I'm praying for everybody because everybody is waiting. Every time you think that you're alone, in the waiting, I, I pray that you will listen out and you will hear your Savior saying to you, even me, even me, I know how you feel. I pray that the Lord would unlock a deep vulnerability between us and him today. I pray that people will be able to vocalize to the Lord the difficulties that they found in waiting upon him. I pray that you will know that God isn't ashamed of your humanity, that it doesn't shock God, the fact that sometimes life is hard and having to wait on a promise is hard, right? Um, I pray for hope. Um, waiting is a result of hope and hope keeps us alive. So I pray that God, anyone waiting who is feeling hopeless, anyone waiting and losing hope, I pray that Father, you would restore hope. 
However, their heart has become sick whilst they are waiting that, Father, you would perform an open heart surgery upon them and you would heal their heart and restore hope back into them. I pray that the Lord will give you dreams and visions because he says in Joel 2 that in the last days I will pour out my spirit and the young will dream will see visions and the old will dream dreams. I pray that if you're young or if you're old, you will see the Lord. That in your sleep, the Lord will even begin to give you hope and remind you of the promises that he has for you, which are of good and not of evil. I pray that you come to the end of your time on earth and you truly see that nothing was wasted, that no waiting was wasted, that no time that God said to you, my daughter, my son, relax here. I want to build something in you. I pray you know that he never wastes anything. And I pray that you know God is always retrieving honey out of the pain. So whatever pain you've experienced whilst you've been waiting on the Lord, there is honey, there is sweetness that's coming out of it. In John 11, Lazarus dies and Jesus waited for two days before going to resurrect him. And this looked so evil. But when Jesus came in his power and his might, they thanked him. Because Lazarus, wait, that Lazarus not rising and, and being dead for those two days was to the glory of God. I pray that every time, every time that you have to wait, you will know that that waiting is to the glory of God. And you will know that God was not wicked for asking you to wait. I pray that you know that the Lord has been preparing you for what he's about to bring you into. And what he wants is that when you enter into that thing, you are prepared, you are fortified, and you are equipped with everything you need as a byproduct of your waiting. All the people we see in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11 are people who had to wait. So God, I pray that you will make us men and women of faith that this nation, that this generation will remember. I pray that these people you are preparing who are so close to the promise will not blow it by being wary in the waiting. I pray that you will not blow what God has for you by being wary in the waiting. I pray that the Lord will get maximum glory out of your life and out of the weight that is required from your life. I decree Amos 9.13 to 15 in the message version over you that things are going to happen so fast for you your head will begin to swim one thing fast on the heels of the other you won't be able to keep up everything will be happening at once and everywhere you look blessings i pray that as you wait you will find at the end of the wait that what God had in store for you was so much bigger and better than anything you could have, could have imagined. Just like Ephesians 3.20, I pray that you will see that God's mighty power at work in you could do infinitely more than you can ask, think, or imagine. I also pray that God brings us all into a place of retrospect and you begin to see how there are things you waited on the Lord for that you are now walking in. And the Lord releases thanksgiving and gratitude over your heart because God has been good to you. Don't let the enemy minimize what you do have and maximize what you're still waiting on the Lord for. God has been good and will continue to be good to you in Jesus' name. Amen.